Great. Welcome to everyone joining us for this evening's Nutshell Discussion. My name is Kelly Gilbo and I'm one of the two outreach coordinators for the Savannah Institute. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Savannah Institute if it's your first time joining us. We're a nonprofit organization that's focused on research and education about agroforestry. And that means that we're working with trees that produce crops, which help make farms more profitable, resilient, and healing for the environment. This can take many forms depending on the, form, the farm or the goals that they, they've got. A lot of our work is doing research in cooperation with farmers, connecting those farmers and scientists at universities with other organizations. We host lots of events at farms. We have a perennial farm gathering each year. This year, uh, December 7th and 8th, keep an eye out for that Save the Date coming out soon. And this is all with the aim of helping farmers to share what they're learning with each other and more broadly. Uh, if you haven't yet been to savannahinstitute.org, you should definitely check it out. There's tons of educational resources, uh, and we're adding more every day. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central SARE. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these discussions for free. Uh, so let's get to the main event this evening. Uh, if you're joining us from a computer, I want to invite you throughout our discussion with Richard to share your questions or comments in the chat box of the platform. There's a little chat bubble on the pop-up screen and you can just click and type in whatever you'd like. I'll be monitoring that throughout. Uh, at the end of our time, uh, maybe about 45 after, uh, we'll turn to the Q&A part of the evening. And so I'll enable the Q&A platform and those on a computer will be able to use your mic uh, to ask a question and those on your phone will be able, uh, I'll give you instructions about how to dial in at that time to get in the queue for the questions. Uh, great, so uh, we are honored to welcome our presenter for this evening, Richard Strait. Uh, Richard co-leads the extension and outreach effort of the National Agroforestry Center or the NAC, located in Lincoln, Nebraska. He began working with the Na Nebraska Forest Service in 1985, then with the NRCS in 1998, and has been with NAC since 2000. So a wealth of information here, and we're definitely look looking forward to the presentation. So with that, Richard, I will turn things over to you and make you the presenter here. I will also mute your mic. So now I have power, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, again, uh, I'm Rich Strait, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation from the Savannah Institute to participate in this discussion. And uh, for the first part of this, it won't feel much like a discussion. It'll feel like me talking at you, maybe fairly rapidly. I'd like to try and get through this information and then have some conversation and uh, and hopefully it'll be a conversation because uh, many of the programs that are going to talk about I have not personally engaged with I don't have a farm I'm not a farmer I'm a forester by training and uh, but uh, we'd like to just try and um, provide a little more information on uh, the programs and resources that are available uh, through USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, that are available to assist in the development and in the uh, support of agroforestry practices around the country. And since uh, I know Savannah Institute is focused here in the, the Midwest, or upper Midwest, but uh, the way the world goes and the recordings, this could be listened to by any number of folks. So. With that, I'll just uh, move right along here. And I want to say, uh, first of all, a thank you to Kate McFarland, one of my colleagues at the Agroforestry Center. Uh, she had done a similar talk uh, back in March, I believe it was, and I stole liberally from Kate's presentation uh, because some things just don't change. So for just to give you a perspective, uh, I am with the U.S. Forest Service when the partners with the National Agroforestry Center. The Natural Resources Conservation Service is the other part, primary partner. And we'll talk a little bit about the center very briefly. And then uh, talk about some of the USDA programs, both for technical and financial assistance that are available. And then we'll talk about how you can find agroforestry in the Farm Bill. And I'll just say right up front, 
that you won't find the word agroforestry uh, very often in the Farm Bill itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then if people want to talk about the next Farm Bill, there isn't much in the defi definitive. But if we want to talk about the next Farm Bill, we can try and carve out a little bit of time for that as well. So in 2011, a number of the six USDA agencies came together and developed this report to America on agroforestry. And even though it's 2011, 2012 dated, it's still a pretty good resource as far as giving an idea of the programs and the types of assistance that are out there from various USDA programs. And you can find that uh, on that website there, usda.gov slash agroforestry or on the National Agroforestry website and it's a very nice little resource. I highly recommend that you check it out. So the Agroforestry Center is uh, primarily all of us but our director are located in Lincoln, Nebraska and there are some advantages of having your director half a country away and there are some disadvantages. But uh, for right now, let's just say that we have two agroforesters, that's Kate McFarland and myself, who lead out our, it says TTNA, that's our technology transfer and application. Think of that as extension type work, education work. We have one information assistant, Joe, who helps make our materials and our website look uh, interesting, hopefully long enough that people will pause and take a look at it. And we have an NRCS agroforester position that is currently vacant. Uh, we had an agroforester retire and that position just hasn't been filled. We also have a couple of administrative assistants. And then on the research side of the Agroforestry Center, we have three scientist positions. We had two of them retire last year, and we're looking to fill one of those here very shortly. We have a GIS specialist, and then our technician also retired. So we've had a few openings in the last couple of years, but that's the center. So when people think they want to come to visit the National Center uh, for Agroforestry, I try to let them know it's a group of really nice people, uh, but we have moved our um, type of work that we do so that uh, we don't have a lot of field facilities, and I'll touch base on that in a little bit. So our outreach and education products are primarily in print form. We have several different lines of publications. Some are like the brochures are six pages, and they get into a little more depth. And then we have technical notes that are more on the how-to on a specific as aspect of an agroforestry practice. The information sheets have become very popular. They're just uh, front and back of one side of a you know, front, front and back of a piece of paper that focus in on a, a narrow subject, an issue related to agroforestry or in agriculture and the environment. We have a newsletter that goes out about three times a year, and that is uh, all these are available online, or you can subscribe and get uh, any of these new publications when they come out. We also have some sample presentations that people can use and customize. There's some tools that our research folks have des developed that are uh, decision-making tools. And then we also have floor displays. If people want to use those for an upcoming meeting, uh, we just ask that you pay for the return shipment. So, And you can take a look at those online before you request them. Uh, we also, when we have funding, help support demonstration sites because uh, seeing uh, types of agroforestry practices on the ground are just so much more educational and informative. We put help with training with a number of partners and workshops and provide some online webinars and trainings and, um, and work with other partners all across the country. So that's our outreach. And then our research is really working on um, more taking the existing research that is out there and trying to synthesize that information to create decision-making tools and help folks understand the role of agroforestry in addressing the, the needs and issues in the world of agriculture and forestry today. And uh, I'll just keep moving right along. So we have researchers, we have outreach and education, and we work with the NRCS in helping to provide information into their programs and their support staff. Um, I'll just, I'm going to keep moving. So when the 2014 Farm Bill came out, we put out an, an issue of our Inside Agroforestry Newsletter, Volume 24, Issue 2, to try and summarize the programs that are available out there. And since we don't have a new Farm Bill, a lot of that stuff is still relevant. So if you want to take a look at that issue of the 
the newsletter. It's available as a download from the Agroforestry's website. And we look at USDA support largely in two areas, technical assistance and financial assistance. And the types of financial assistance I have listed there. So it's more than just what we've uh, maybe come to know as cost share assistance of 50% of the cost of establishment. Uh, there are a number of different programs that are available. And we're going to try and run through a number of those from different USDA agencies. And I'll also give you a little heads up. The pretty pictures are done for the rest of this presentation. Um, because we're talking about programs and USDA agencies that are out there, uh, I'm just, and that this PowerPoint will be made available to folks in a PDF format after this evening. Um, I figured words are the probably more useful than pictures uh, as far as using this presentation as a reference. So we're going to just go ahead and, and move right along. So an, a relatively new effort within USDA is this farmers.gov uh, website. And it's, um, I believe, actually a www.farmers.gov. Uh, farmers and it's really trying to be a, a, quite the, the resource for folks to uh, find information, to find programs, to, um, for, for you to, uh, and as you can see there at the bottom of the screen, find your local service center. And um, at many, many of these service centers you'll find uh, employees with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the uh, Farm Services Agency and the Risk Risk Management Agency, all co-located and often with a local conservation district. So they're trying to create these service centers to be uh, full service so that regardless of which program you might be interested in or what your needs are, when you go in, you'll find somebody who can uh, assist you in developing conservation plan or finding the right programs to uh, help you address the conservation need or the um, op um, needs of your enterprise. So the farmers.gov is one place I uh, suggest people take a look and it's a little bit different organization rather than going through agency by agency. This is a really good place to start. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture has also made a priority to um, communicate, reach out to, and provide assistance to new and beginning farmers. And basically, they define that as anyone who's been farming less than 10 years. And this newfarmers.usda.gov is a, an, another way for folks to uh, get some information, to have some questions ready before you move into and go into the service center. And so you're not starting from scratch. And you get a little bit more information on what the programs are. And when you if you want to use this discovery tool, it'll ask you where you're located, a little bit about your demographic, uh, the cr types of crops you're interested in, uh, how you want to market or sell your crops, and then the type of assistance that you're looking for. And then it'll give you a list of uh, the programs and information and agencies that might be available to assist you in the type of assistance that you're looking for. So. Whether you're a new farmer or not, I still think this is a really good tool to uh, find resources that are custom fit to the questions that you've got. So I highly recommend newfarmers.usda.gov. Then as we burrow down from USDA at the, at the uh, high level, the Ag Marketing Service. So a lot of folks think of uh, USDA programs because they're familiar with the Natural Resources Conservation Service as a conservation organization, uh, they may not be as familiar with agencies like the Ag Marketing Service, which is here not to provide assistance toward conservation, but actually in the, the business side of your enterprise. And they have, like I listed there, the specialty crop, excuse me, specialty crop block grants and uh, let's see here. That's that's something. Here's an example of uh, folks in Pennsylvania with ramps, really trying to help folks to become more competitive with specialty crops. Uh, there's enough information out there on commodity crops, and so these specialty crop block grants um, 
are really focused on the local food and specialty crops. And of course, then there are uh, quite a bit of emphasis within USDA on organic cost share programs. And more and more folks are having to be, who are producing local food and selling local food or s direct marketing of, of food that they grow are needing to be aware of the good agricultural practices and the good handling practices. And there is a program to help you understand how, what those rules are, how they are applied, and get some training on those practices. And um, I just hear more and more folks being um, expressing some concern, not concern, interest in doing these practices right. Because when you have a certified operation, uh, then one, you know your food is safe. Two, that's uh, something that our consumers are looking for as ways to know that uh, the food that they're buying, the food that they're giving to their families is has been handled well, prepared well, and is safe to eat. The Farm Services Agency is another one that folks who are in the farming community, and particularly commodity farming, are probably well aware of. And the the big programs that have been going on for a while, the Conservation Reserve Program and the more focused CREP or Conservation Reserve Enhancement Programs are really a joint effort between Farm Services and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, whereas the program dollars come through Farm Services, FSA, and the technical assistance is often through local conservation districts and then NRCS. And those programs for agroforestry practices um, within CRP, the, the linear practices like windbreaks and riparian forest buffers have been um, very well supported within this program because they are um, non-competitive practices. And some of them have been continuous sign-up in the past, whereas many of these programs have very specific sign-up periods. And the, the fact that windbreaks and riparian forest buffers and even to some extent alley cropping are seen as uh, buffer practices, uh, that gives folks who are interested in establishing those um, uh, some assistance in getting the, the trees and shrubs and grasses and, and other plants uh, established. This, these are 10 and 15 year contract periods with annual uh, payments in lieu of income. The downside on those two programs is while they are, while your land is under contract because there is an annual payment made, uh, you're not able to harvest and sell crop from those acres under the CRP or CREP contracts. Uh, that is not the case under EQIP. Um, there are also farm loans, a, ver a number of types of farm loans, as you can see listed there. And some of them require uh, like no um, down payment, some only 5% down payment on some of the micro loans. I just saw, let's see here, advertised, I just got an, an email today that said um, that FSA has introduced an, a new loan category of microloans, um, up to $50,000 balance in loans and only a 5% down payment is required, whereas some of the other uh, loan programs require a 15% down payment. So there's some good information available there, some loans for uh, folks interested in, in supporting agroforestry. And the thing about these is you won't see the word agroforestry in the program. You won't see that it supports agroforestry. Uh, you'll have to look at the program and see what are your needs and will this loan program or will that ag marketing service program assist your farm operation. Uh, and so I, I just encourage folks not to focus on finding the word agroforestry or permaculture uh, in these programs. Uh, that doesn't mean they cannot be used to support the establishment and, and ongoing um, enhancement of an agroforestry practice. The other, the last one I'll mention here on this slide, the non-insured crop disaster assistance program is, is another one that uh, for many of the, Many of us who live in counties where wheat and corn and soybeans and cotton and these other commodity crops are grown, when disaster strikes, the, the agencies 
can take a good assessment of the the amount of damage, the extent of damage uh, in the county. But if you're the only producer of pick a crop, aronia or cantaloupe in your county, um, they don't fit well into that program. So these are um, this program is a crop disaster assistance for folks who are raising non-commodity crops and they're getting more and more crops listed and some baseline information on these non-commodity crops. So there's one that is uh, I'm really pleased to see a USDA helping to support um, folks who are growing people food and local food. The uh, other farm services agencies, there are some other loans, uh, maybe not as important to uh, folks involved with agroforestry when it comes to storage facilities, uh, but that second bullet on portable storage and handling and cold storage uh, equipment might just be something that a group of producers, a cooperative uh, group of folks might need in order to extend their marketing season in harvesting and keeping good quality or good condition of the food and the products that they're harvesting. So Farm Services has a variety of loans and I encourage you if you're looking to uh, enhance or extend your operation, take a look at those. The uh, Risk Management Agency is another program that folks may not be as familiar with. The Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program is really geared at farms that grow uh, multiple crops. And in this case, the bare minimum is two crops. But the idea, again, is it's not based on yield. It is based on your uh, farm operation. And it is uh, in a type of insurance program that is um, also out there. And it's, um, it's available in every state and every county in the country. It is crop neutral. Uh, there is a premium subsidy for up to 80% when at least two crops are grown and another premium discount if you have increased diversification. Um, they have uh, coverage levels up to 85% of the revenue of your farm and it can include some incidental processing expenses uh, to make your crop ready for markets such as washing, trimming, packaging and that sort of thing. So it's a um, very interesting insurance program that, uh, again, I think USDA is really starting to recognize the value of uh, local food producers, people who are growing something other than commodity crops. And and as has been for the last 10 or more years, organic crop insurance and organic growers, they've been getting quite a bit of attention and will continue to do so. And, and so if you are uh, involved in growing organic crops, risk management agency also has some insurance options. I'm going to shift gears real quick or quickly and mention the USDA Forest Service. Now most folks when they think about agriculture and food production don't think of the Forest Service but if you're into growing non-timber forest products, if you're into managing your woodlands, possibly growing um, uh, mushrooms and other herbal medicinal plants. Uh, the Forest Stewardship Program is one that is a, as a USDA, U.S. Forest Service program, but it's delivered and implemented through state forestry agencies, and those would be the people you'd want to contact, either the district forester or the state office, and find out who is the person who can provide you direct assistance in your in your county or your part of the state. And I'll just leave, go with that and also mention that uh, the U.S. Forest Service is a primary partner of the National Agroforestry Center and so uh, we see the efforts that we have, as I was mentioned earlier, as a part of the USDA program to support agroforestry. And that's, I'll just keep that one pretty short uh, since I've already talked about the Agroforestry Center. Let's see here, how am I doing on time, Kelly? Okay. So NIFA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, I've heard it also referenced as NIFA. Um, this, is, this agency has 
really got some great programs for folks interested in growing specialty crops, local food, uh, sustainable agriculture, and they have a, a number of programs and, and virtually all the dollars that go into this agency go out to somebody else. It's a fantastic organization and they're great to work with. They provide assistance to universities. They have some fairly large grants that are related to the AFRI, the Agriculture and Food and Research Initiative, and these are often partnerships across multiple universities or universities and producers. And then they also have the Specialty Crop Research Initiative. Um, there's an example there, the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative is funded through NIFA under their Specialty Crop Research Grants. So I'm going to touch base on some of the NIFA programs that are available. Probably the one that you're most familiar with is SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Uh, this little graphic is, comes right out of our newsletter, and uh, it's to help you think about who are you and uh, then recognizing that the SARE program is delivered in four different regions in the country. And so if you're a researcher, a producer, if you're a community organization, if you're an educator, and then what are the programs in each region that are available. And as you can see by this, uh, SARE it really supports uh, the, the full spectrum of folks involved in agriculture and sustainable agriculture with a variety of programs. They do administer programs uh, regionally. And, and it's very important to know which region you're in because even though it's a national program, the way the programs are administered varies from region to region. Uh, different deadlines for signing up, different dates when they put out information and calls for proposals. So you'll want to pay attention to the uh, regional SARE office that is appropriate for you to make sure that you have the right information so that you can take advantage, full advantage of the programs that SARE provides. And um, this is another example of a direct of a um, North Central SARE Farmer Researcher Grant. And they do work with farmers uh, directly if you're looking to do uh, something new or a new way, a new approach of either growing, managing, or harvesting a crop. And there are also programs they have where farmers, producers work with um, universities. And one of the most important things I can tell you with the, the SARE grants is um, they have straightforward forms to fill out when you're applying. They will help walk you through what information you need to put into the application form. They also have a, you can go onto the SARE website and find previous projects and you can search through all the previously funded uh, projects, grant applications that have been out there. And you can search under specific subjects, specific areas, states, um, and a number of factors so you can find out has somebody already looked into the question that you're trying to address? And you can also find, that gives you an idea of what are the sorts of projects that have been funded so that can give you an idea of the type of project that, how you might adjust your proposal uh, to be more attractive, to be more likely to be funded. So learn from those previous projects. Uh, we just had some interns go through all of the SARE projects that have been funded, search for anything related to agroforestry, and we're about to put up that as a searchable library of SARE projects on the National Agroforestry website. I hope we get up there by the end of this month. And um, it is just our effort to try and pare down all the good work, all the sustainable ag research and projects that SARE has funded, uh, and just have those listed that are relevant to agroforestry. So it makes it a little easier for you to search if you're interested in doing that. So SARE, uh, great resource. Uh, take a look at past projects. You can learn from those as well as um, utilize our programs to investigate or check into uh, your ideas of how to improve agroforestry in agroforestry production 
where you live. Rural Development also has uh, some grants. Again, these are business, you know, system oriented, uh, your enterprise oriented, not on the conservation side of things. And I'm going to skip across because I'm going to spend a little bit of time with NRCS. But the Natural Resources Conservation Service, a partner with the National Lake of Forestry Center, uh, the forestry folks within NRCS are pretty knowledgeable about agroforestry. A number of the agri uh, agricultural and animal husbandry, husbandry folks are as well. And uh, when you're looking at NRCS programs, that five-step process is uh, crucial in getting a plan, finding the application forms, finding out which programs you're eligible for, and many other programs are competitive. So finding your ranking, you can find out what sorts of activities, what sorts of uh, things in your proposal can give you a higher ranking, and then they provide technical assistance as well as the financial assistance to implement those programs. And whereas SARE and uh, Ag Marketing Service and Risk Management, some of those are interested in assisting a farm operation from a business side for often, um, NRCS, the real focus is on conservation. What is it that you want to do um, and how will it improve a conservation need in your area, on your farm, in your watershed? Uh, what are the conservation issues? Is it clean water, wildlife habitat? Is it sediment? Is it uh, biodiversity? And so the the focus is not on production but more on conservation but that does not mean we can't use those conservation programs to help establish and improve the ongoing management of our agriculture practices so there are is a, is a list of many of the NRCS programs equip which is the the large program that they have uh, conservation stewardship program is really if you're already involved in sustainable ag and agroforestry, you ought to take a look at the conservation stewardship program. It starts with they, they want to see farm operators who are addressing at least two conservation issues or conservation needs. And then they have funding on an annual basis to, to pay to keep those rolling and assist in uh, enhancing your operation to address one or more additional conservation needs that are set for priority in your part of the state. So it's a really interesting program. Uh, I think it, it came about from folks tired of paying people who are doing poor farming practices, causing environmental issues, and constantly paying them to fix their problems. And this program was really geared to toward trying to encourage good producers who are responsible producers in continuing to do good work and do even better. Uh, the RCCP, RCPP, Regional Conservation Partnership Programs, are again often watershed based or multiple watersheds across, sometimes cross state boundaries, and are involved with often uh, state agencies as well as producers and nonprofit organizations uh, to address large scale issues within a state. I mentioned the Conservation Reserve Program and CREP, even though those are FSA programs because NRCS provides technical assistance for those. And then again, I mentioned the National Lake Forestry Center. Um, I, I'm going to skip over these, this set of slides uh, because it's, it's good for you, it's good information to have, but I want to spend a lot of time going through it. But it's one thing to know that NRCS breaks down the work that they will assist in in conservation practices. And if a particular conservation practice is not on the list of practices supported within your state, then it's not eligible to be cost shared under EQIP or CREP or CRP or any of the other programs. And so one way to find out if an agroforestry practice is available in your state is to use, it's often referred to as the eFOTOG or it's the online version of the field office technical guide. And it can be rather cumbersome to, to find that information. And so on the National Agroforestry website under 
the practices. There's a tab across the top of our web page that says practices. It gives you information on how to bore into the field office technical guide to find in your state which practices are supported within your state. And so that's what this set of slides is for. And I'm just going to skip through those. Uh, here are basically five agroforestry practices and then windbreak restoration that are listed. And you'll notice each of those has a number uh, because each of these conservation practices has a number associated with them. But there are the five agroforestry practices as well as windbreak renovation. And so that's just a resource. It's a place to start to find out um, is what you're interested in doing supported within NRCS. This slide is to remind you that even though you may have civil pasture listed within that state, it may not be a priority practice. However, that doesn't mean that you couldn't use existing programs to support a civil pasture uh, practice on your property. You'll see here there is fencing, there is brush management, there is tree and shrub establishment. So you could use some of these other practices as components to establish and create a civil pasture or a system of civil pastures on your property, even though civil pasture itself may not be a standard, a practice standard that is supported in your state. So that, in other words, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So think about those practices that you might utilize to enhance or establish an agroforestry practice without using, again, the name of that practice, be it alley cropping or civil pasture. So that's that list of practices. And this is just, again, on EQIP, which is the, one of the largest programs within NRCS, is we have to see if the state in the upper left offers that practice. Uh, what is the ranking process that's available? Uh, some states have funding pools that are targeted towards specific practices or types of conservation. Missouri happens to be one state that has a funding pool dedicated toward agroforestry practices, and I know other states are looking at that as well. And so that reduces the size of the pool that you'd be competing with uh, for EQIP funds if there are funds dedicated toward agroforestry or dedicated toward livestock. And then the payment schedules, that's the phrase that I'm trying to get used to using. Uh, for years, for decades, we talked about cost share. People said, well, what's the cost share rate? Well, it's 50% or it's 65% of the county, act, county average cost to establish fence or to establish forage, or whatever the conservation practice. Well, now they've developed payment schedules, and so they are typically not a single practice payment schedule. They, if you were talking about a windbreak, you can find a schedule for site preparation, cost of seedling, cost of planting, and two years of weed control. That may be a payment schedule. There may be a separate one that includes fencing or a, another one that would include uh, conservation mulch along with those other elements. So a little bit of terminology, but the idea is still the same to provide a portion of the assistance for the establishment of a conservation practice. Um, again, EQIP is focused on what is the resource concern, water, sediment, nutrient management, livestock issues. Um, is the practice offered? How will it rank? And you can work with your local field office to, to understand what historically has been uh, competitive practice within your county, within your state. The conservation stewardship program I mentioned as one that they're trying to encourage folks who are doing good work to do even better work. And it's, it's got some really profitable, very interesting payment schedules. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, here are just some of the RCPP programs that are projects that are being funded right now in Wisconsin. And some of those may look familiar to you if you're in Wisconsin. Again, these are multiple years. Um, and larger scale projects. They're not just for a single farm operation, but if you find that you are in an area that's under an RCPP, uh, you'll find that they may have uh, very specific programs and, and payment schedules available to assist you to 
engage in that project. Um, some additional resources, and then I'll also give Kelly a few others that uh, she can send out after this recording. And again, I mentioned the newsletter, the USDA Farmers website, the New Farmers website, and then this last one I haven't talked about yet is we had an intern we worked with seven USDA agencies to identify funding that's available for research. So this may or may not be interest much of interest to producers unless you're part of a larger co-op or you're working with your university and you say, hey, you know, here are some real issues that we're facing in our state that we'd like to get some answers to and we'd like to work with maybe your land grant university to get some answers to. And this um, summary of the available research funding sources from a variety of USDA agencies. We have that available on our National Agri Forestry website. It's a long URL, so I put a uh, a bit a bitly short uh, URL there that you can use to go to that publication. So I was moving right along, but again, I was thinking this is more of a awareness level. People can take the presentation, uh, bore into it a little more deeply, use some of the links that are provided there. Some of the slides have some notes that uh, folks may find useful. And I want to end with uh, that uh, the National Web Agroforestry Center website has changed to its, the top website there listed. We do send out about a quarterly email update on new publications, and you can sign up for that there on that link. If you're interested in being our mailing list and we have new publications that come out, uh, you can contact me and I'll put you on that mailing list. If you're in the area of the Northeast Mid-Atlantic Agroforestry Working Group, you can sign up to get, they have a monthly email that comes out on information of activities, projects, and programs going on related to agroforestry. There's a Mid-America Agroforestry Working Group that has a monthly email that you can sign up for. And if you have any questions on any of these things, there's my email address again, and I'd be more than happy to try and connect you with someone locally that can help you, or if I can answer your question, I'll try and do that. So Kelly, I was, hopefully we left a little bit of time here for folks to have questions or conversation uh, about, and maybe somebody's got some experience with, with some of these USDA programs that they'd like to share with the rest of the group. I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. That was such a wealth of information, Rick. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope uh, the listeners here tonight and online really take advantage of all these links you provided and everything. Um, I was wondering, all right, just all the differences per state. Um, it seems, you know, you mentioned it, there are regional differences and then each state sort of decides what their what their standards are. Um, are there are there drastic differences around the country as far as what qualifies for funding or grants, uh, proposals, or is there some consistency uh, that a person can start with? So typically, the programs are, are not going to. They have national guidelines, and then states, regardless of which agency it is, they working through like NRCS, the state technical committee has representatives across the agricultural spectrum to provide input to the state conservationist and they try to set what are the local priorities for our state. Uh, is, are the, is it livestock? Is it a, a water quality? Is it in the estuary? Um, um, they, they try and set priorities that way. So the programs may not be, the program hasn't changed, but the emphasis or the priority within a state is what changes most often uh, to address the local conservation needs. And uh, so that's where I think the di distinctions are going to be. And, and so in some cases we'll find that in the Great Plains states, for example, uh, windbreaks are often a high priority. But when we move uh, in, into east central U.S., Ohio and Kentucky and, and Tennessee, windbreaks just are not as high a priority because the, the, there isn't that need related to wind protection for livestock or farm operations. And 
so that's where we'll see some of the distinctions made um, more so than we will um, just a program not offered. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So a, a local farmer would likely be have similar priorities to the state's priorities since they're in the same area. They may or may not, depending on, uh, right. And Yes, depending on, and you may find have a producer that happens to be sitting on a fairly sandy soil where wind erosion of soil is, is a big issue and, and maybe for the most of the state that wind erosion of soil isn't a high priority and uh, so they may find that they may not get the ear that they would like. Rick, I don't know if you want to uh, get into some farm bill thoughts <laughs> since you brought that up at the beginning. <laughs> You know, it, it sounds like um, there are some people in really interested in seeing that a farm bill gets uh, signed and executed before the mid-year uh, midterm elections. Um, if you're interested in that farm bill, I'd highly recommend you take advantage of uh, the processes available to communicate with uh, with with congressmen and their staff. Um, I've I've talked to some folks that are optimistic, and I've talked to some po folks who are pessimistic about that. Um, I think the agricultural state representatives and senators from agricultural states are obviously uh, quite supportive. It's still in the formative process. There are a number of organizations that group together to address larger scale issues to have a larger voice. And uh, I think those are the methods that folks find to be most productive in trying to um, encourage um, a, f a really functional and beneficial farm bill program. Um, I don't know if anybody else has heard anything more recently. I've been traveling a bit and haven't been able to stay up on it as much, and I think isn't Congress even in uh, recess right now. So uh, I wish I had more, I wish I had some definitive information but um, right now, I think it's still up in the air. That's the last I heard. I don't know if anybody else has heard any more information that they would like to share. I'm wondering if you think uh, even the, the word agroforestry might be uh, you know, included in some of these programs or, or documents moving forward at some point. Is, is there a reason why? Um, there's sort of these back, around, back ways to, to get funding, um, more than one way to skin a cat, you said, <laughs> uh, as agroforestry sort of takes off or, or gets more of a grounding, might it be included in the future? Well, we've sometimes uh, kidded ourselves, uh, the folks in the agroforestry community, saying that the word agroforestry may be one of the larger barriers in the adoption of agroforestry. Uh, because uh, some just not clear understanding of what we mean by agroforestry. Um, so I, the, the agroforestry does appear in the Farm Bill. Uh, it isn't, well, uh, unless there's a champion that's really advocating for it, I don't think we're going to see agroforestry, the words, show up in the Farm Bill. Uh, there have been more and more questions about things like uh, riparian buffers that where you can also grow a crop, a tree crop or a shrub crop, nuts and fruits within a riparian forest buffer. So there, I hear interest in, uh, I just heard the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry in Virginia this last week say that uh, Bettina Ring said she believes that multifunctional riparian buffers are something we really ought to look at and support more of so it have conservation practices that also support the farm, the local farm economy, the local producers' uh, financial situation. So there are more and more folks interested in it, and uh, I don't expect to see the word agroforestry show up uh, very explicitly in the Farm Bill, but I think the idea of, as you can see by a number of those programs within um, FSA and risk management and ag marketing service are really looking toward local food uh, non-commodity crops, there's a growing interest in supporting that type of agriculture. So hopefully we'll see more and more opportunities that way. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, 
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any any questions from our audience here. Um, so, Rick, any final words or anything you'd like to leave us with? Uh, just that uh, if you go to the National Language Forestry Center website, we have a list of a, a variety of resources, publications. We have a webinar library if you want to watch other webinars. There is, um, we're going to have that uh, searchable library of SARE projects that related to agroforestry. And also check out the University of Missouri's Center for Agroforestry. They have some really good, um, they've really delved into several products, chestnuts and elderberries and a few other crops very, very deeply. Uh, the, the folks at Cornell, uh, the University of Minnesota's CINRAM, C-I-N-R-A-M, uh, Penn State University, there are some real hotbeds of agroforestry support. Virginia Tech University, that may, even if it's not in your state, the, the, they have extension people, foresters, researchers who are really looking into agroforestry. And it's exciting to see more and more folks um, taking up uh, the issue of local food, sustainable food production in, in ways that uh, benefit the land, wildlife, people and communities. So uh, by all no means is the National Agroforestry Center uh, the only source of information out there and I encourage you to, to look around. As well as the Savannah Institute, I might say. <laughs> Thanks for that plug, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, well, uh, thank you so much for that information. Thanks to all of you for joining us for the evening. Um, I will be sending out a uh, a survey uh, just in the next few days. Um, any feedback you have about tonight is more than welcome. Um, but also, as you know, Rick's given his email, so definitely keep in touch uh, and ask any follow-up questions that come to you later. Uh, also, in the next few days, I'll just I'll be announcing the fall nutshell series. So we've got some really great uh, presenters, lots of different kinds of information coming up. So keep an eye out for that listing in the next couple of days. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thank you again to Rick. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity.